Thank you all so very much for being with us today. Um, I'm Amanda Graham. I am the Academic Director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society here at Dartmouth College, where our mission is to examine energy in real life. How does energy impact every sector and every level of society, and how do we shape our energy systems in, in turn? Um, today, we're taking up the question of how energy is a core factor, a core dimension of the ongoing unprovoked war in Ukraine and how the conflict there may impact Europe's energy transition. Energy weaves cultures and societies together, but as we're seeing now, it can also be a factor in, in breaking them apart. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome two experts in this area to join us today to deepen our understanding of energy in the context of Eastern Europe and global geopolitics. Our featured speaker today is Professor Philip Chernok, who is a visiting scholar, a visiting Fulbright scholar at Dartmouth Institute, at Dartmouth College with the Irving Institute. Um, Dr. Chernok is the Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations and European Studies at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. Um, and he's been visiting us during this academic year, 2021-2022. Uh, um, his research during his time at Dartmouth is on the ongoing energy transition lessons from the U.S. coal phase out, although I don't know if that has been um, has been shifting at all, um, given recent developments. Um, and he also just finished teaching a course on energy policy um, for our undergraduates, EU energy policy during our winter term. And uh, Dr. Chernok has a master's degree in international relations and a Ph.D. in political science, uh, both from Masaryk University. I'm also delighted um, today to, um, to welcome uh, Professor Roman Sidortsov to moderate today's event. Professor Sidortsov is Associate Professor of Energy Policy at Michigan Technical University, but he does have local roots. Um, his JD and LLM are from Vermont Law School, just up the road. His PhD is from Cambridge University, and his master's is from Irkutsk State University in Siberia, where he was raised. Um, he's published widely in energy justice, energy law, and he's active in Arctic energy research. And so please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Professors Chernok and uh, Sidortsov this morning. And with that, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to um, tune myself out, hand the mic over to Professor Sidortsov, and um, uh, he'll give you the sort of the run of show that we're going to um, follow uh, this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, it is an absolute pleasure um, to uh, take part in this event and to um, have a discussion on um, the uh, perhaps the most important geopolitical shift um, in the energy world, at least in, in my lifetime. Um, I um, had a pleasure of uh, meeting um, Dr. Chernock um, yesterday via Zoom. Uh, we had a productive conversation uh, yesterday and we really brainstormed about uh, not just the complexity, but also the, um, the, the volume of, um, of, of the implications um, of, uh, that are uh, likely to come out, out of the uh, the invasion of Russia, uh, the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by Russia. So uh, we um, decided that uh, for the bulk of the uh, um, of, of the talk today, um, we will concentrate on the implications of uh, the invasion um, on uh, on the EU, on the Europe uh, in particular. And uh, then very briefly, um, we will um, talk about the implications of this uh, horrendous military conflict uh, uh, on Russia and perhaps um, um, on the energy transition uh, in general. We will start with uh, Dr. Chernok's presentation uh, for about 30, 35 minutes, and then I will um, give uh, brief remarks related to the Russia side of, of things and touch on the energy transition. And then we will open up uh, the floor for questions. And um, uh, we received quite a few of these questions and I wish we had a day to uh, talk about it because the questions are um, excellent uh, and they are very deep and they do require quite a bit of um, elaboration. However, we don't have a day, so I will group these questions by the topic. Um, I will exercise my moderate uh, discretion, <laughs> uh, moderator discretion, I should say, and um, we will um, we'll try to address as many as we can. 
So without further ado, Dr. Chernock, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much as well for this very kind and, and uh, fluttering introduction. Mm, as you mentioned, we have plenty of questions, and I believe this, uh, this talk should provide some background for understanding of this competition between European Union, or maybe battle now, uh, between the European Union and Russia in terms of energy. We do have quite a lot of work to do and not that much time, so let's get straight into it. I believe that now you should see my presentation. Am I correct? Yes. Splendid. Uh, okay, so uh, I need to start with a uh, obvious but still very important comment that Europe is Russia's main um, export market in terms of its, uh, its crude oil and natural gas. And by extension, Europe is the primary source of income for, for Russia in terms of in terms of hydrocarbons. If you look at the if you look at the chart, uh, you may see that Europe is is heavily heavily dependent on imports of, of fossil fuels. Almost all crude oil is imported. Uh, Twenty seven percent of that from Russia. In terms of natural gas, ninety percent, forty one percent from Russia. So in this regard, Europe really is dependent both on imports and Russia in particular. Uh, it applies to Russia as well, this dependency or mutual interdependence. Um, in terms of Russia's budget, state budget, hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons represents like one third, maybe a little bit more now uh, of, its, of its income, which is quite a lot. Without exporting hydrocarbons, Russia would be uh, even more poor than it is now. <clears throat> um, half of oil it goes to goes to Europe. Uh, almost all natural gas. Uh, there are some tiny exports to Asia uh, using LNG uh, in Sakhalin or Yamal or via the power of Siberia. But the bulk of production, bulk of export, goes to to Europe, which makes both these actors interdependent on each other, and both Russia and the European Union must incorporate this fact, this mutual, in, mutual uh, interdependence into their foreign policy thinking or strategy. <clears throat> and I will illustrate uh, the way in which these actors deal with this dependency on the example of Central and Eastern European countries, including Ukraine, because I believe that's the most, most interesting issue these days. And I'll be talking about uh, primarily about natural gas. Not because, and sometimes uh, people do think that that uh, natural gas is is like primary source of income for Russia. It's not true. Like seventy to eighty percent of Russia's income in terms of fossil fuel fossil fuels is from from oil. But um, natural gas is more politicized. Both both uh, actors are more dependent on each other with this fuel. And at the same time, um, natural gas still, <clears throat> sorry, still depends on, on the physical pipelines. Russia exports something like 240 BCM per year, billion cubic meters, uh, 200 of which uh, are transported uh, using pipelines to Europe and only 40 by LNG. So um, the, the, the fact that uh, Russia as a producer and European countries uh, as a consumer are connected with this physical infrastructure that cannot be easily replaced or, or removed uh, or changed makes natural gas much more politically sensitive. I'll be talking about this region really as, as, as title of, of the lecture suggests the, the physical area between Russia as a main supplier of fossil fuels and Germany as a uh, primary consumer uh, for the supplies in, in Europe. And so we'll be talking about Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Poland, mostly. And it is not because of these countries are so important in terms of their own consumption. They are small potatoes in terms of how much natural gas do they consume. Uh, Belarus is, is a small 
uh, exception, it consumes a little bit more because it's a client state of Russia and it's highly subsidized and supported with cheaper natural gas. So the consumption there is a little bit higher. But generally speaking, Ukraine, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, very small consumption of natural gas. So not this is not the reason why um, Russia is concerned about this region. There are some other reasons. The first one is that for a very long time historically, those are the countries that allow the transportation of hydrocarbons from, from Russia to those lucrative Western European markets. In terms of natural gas, it's a, it's a uh, German, as I mentioned, Italy, France, Austria, those are like the, 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 the important markets for, for Russia in terms of natural gas. And as you may see on this picture, um, I'll use this, as you may see on this picture, um, the whole region is important because the transit pipelines are there. The first pipelines from Russia to, to Europe, to Western European markets, the, the, the Soyuz pipeline that was, that was built, I believe in 1987, it was finished that year. Um, that's, that's a massive pipeline multiple pipelines delivering natural gas from, from Russia through Ukraine, Czechoslovakia back then to, to Western part of Europe. The same applies a little bit later, finished in 1996, the, the Yamal Europe pipeline going from Russia through, through Belarus to Poland and again to, to Western, uh, Western markets. So this is one reason why uh, Russia is, is concerned about this region, simply because this is the way how to transport hydrocarbons to Europe. The second reason, a little bit more ephemeral, but for Russia, this area, Russia still believes that these countries should belong to its sphere of influence. Maybe these countries have slightly different opinion on that, but from the perspective of Moscow and political leaders there, these countries should belong to the sphere of influence of Russia, not the European Union. It's particularly important in terms of Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, current political elite really believes that this is the integral part of, well, Russia's empire, inseparable part of, of Russia, but it applies also to Poland, Czech Republic, like the former satellites of of Soviet Union that should belong, <clears throat> or Russia should, it, it, they should be in the, in, the, in the sphere of influence of Russia. So this is the second reason. And the third reason, uh, probably the most important for us for this very talk is that <clears throat> historically, the industry and energy sectors in these countries were built around uh, Russian natural gas. Um, only like these countries used to be dependent fully on Russian supplies, no alternative ways how to get uh, some other supplies to these countries, no physical infrastructure, rather small countries, isolated markets, uh, rather poor countries. So uh, very exposed and quite vulnerable to uh, Russia's pressure. And so what is the speaking about this confrontation between European Union and Russia? What, what is the modus operandi for Russia? Um, <clears throat> the main two historically used to be the price of natural gas. For Russia, it is crucial to be able to offer different prices for customers, uh, to customers, depending on their well, friendliness or unfriendliness. And how that works? Well, to, to explain that, I need to talk a little bit about like the historical gas market model that, developed, that was developed in, in Europe in the 60s with the, the first exploration in, in the Netherlands with Kreningen Field. And so this model, started there and it was universally applied across, the, across Europe for a very long time. And this model depends on 
firstly, the long-term take or pay contracts with a significant foreclosure potential, locking in together supplier and consumer for a very long time for a majority of, of uh, the consumption of, of, of given, given country, given buyer. And second, um, the destination clauses, the provisions in the contracts uh, which prohibit reselling of natural gas to, to other countries, effectively prohibiting uh, price arbitrage, effectively prohibiting, uh, prohibiting competition. And if you combine this market model with the fact that there was no physical infrastructure like to diversify from Russia, it means that for a very long time, at least in the area we were discussing, Russia was able to isolate the individual countries, negotiate bilaterally, Russia versus Poland, <clears throat> Russia versus Slovakia, Russia versus Czech Republic, and offering cheaper gas for political concessions or vice versa, punishing given country with uh, higher costs of, of natural gas. Just look at the look at the, the, the chart there. This is chart from Izviestia, uh, Russian news uh, back in 2012. I believe it was still independent journal. Now it is, it is owned by Gazprom, so it is well, less independent. And um, those are the prices of, of Russian gas to, to European countries. The, the horizontal axis is the price um, in, in the US dollars per thousand of cubic meters. And the, the, the vertical axis is the, is, the, is the size of the market. And <clears throat> you may expect that simply the, the Russian gas would be cheaper closer to Russia because of the transportation costs and would be more expensive the far, the, 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 uh, the longer the distance is from, from Russia to, to, to consuming countries. But if you look at the chart, uh, it's completely over the place. The, the most expensive gas was back then for Poland and the Czech Republic, like 500 per uh, thousand cubic meters. The cheapest gas was for the United Kingdom on the opposite side of Europe, for Germany, for the Netherlands. And obviously the explanation is multifold. Uh, firstly, um, the size of the market matters, your negotiating position, obviously. Uh, the how given market is competitive and, and uh, how many supplier, suppliers is there. So obviously United Kingdom with, uh, or, or Germany with multiple suppliers, uh, higher competition, but also the, the, the political reasoning is there as well. Poland as a, as a country which is traditionally anti-Russia was in a way punished with this crisis of natural gas. But the main message of this picture is that like this is the, this is the preferred model for Russia to be able to offer different customers, different price of, of natural gas. And if needed, and I'm not saying that this is the primary uh, goal of, of, of Gazprom. It's not everything about geopolitics. It's about making money. But if needed to apply the, or to use the, the price of natural gas as a political leverage. Um, and it's maybe more, uh, it's also uh, easy to observe with the, the countries outside of the European Union, look at Belarus and, and Ukraine. 2005, um, rather pro-Russian governments in these countries, very similar prices, 46 bucks, 50 bucks. Uh, in 2004, 2005, Orange Revolution. Uh, uh, later on, this gas wars between, between Russia and Ukraine in 2006, 2009. And while price for Belarus had been increasing somehow, uh, it was much worse for, for Ukraine. Uh, and if I do have data for like later, it would be even more prominent. So this is the, the very nice example of how price 
of natural gas is used to sweeten the, the mutual relationship or, 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 um, or otherwise. Well, the European Union reacted with, to this problem with its project of common energy market. Uh, the idea that European Union should replace this isolated national markets dominated by national monopolies with plenty of barriers for trade of natural gas or electricity across, across the border. So this all should be replaced by common space without internal barriers, which would be liberalized and which would, which would be depoliticized. So uh, the, the first, the physical infrastructure was introduced, linking and joining the, the isolated countries to, to, to their neighbors. So that was, the, that was one tool, how to build this common market. The second tool was to introduce other sources of natural gas, building LNG facilities uh, using European Union money. And the third one was to introduce rather strict regulation that enforces the competition and limits the politicization of, of supplies meaning that there are rules about state aid, there are rules about, about uh, how states could or could not interfere in the market. The whole idea that this whole traditional gas market model was challenged and uh, to a huge extent abandoned. Uh, Long-term contracts are supervised by the European Commission, DG competition, and they are now shorter and and smaller, the destination clauses are forbidden at all in the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, as a result, uh, suppliers to the European Union, they cannot, they are entering the whole market. And if they are trying to manipulate the situation, they need to, they are trying to manipulate the whole market, which is almost impossible, considering the fact how, how large the market is, 500 million uh, people, plenty of suppliers. It's very difficult with this, with this common market to isolate single country and use supplies or the price of natural gas as a political leverage. Just look at this. Look at this, look at this chart, very different from the previous one. Uh, those are the prices of natural gas between 2016 and 2019, different sources, um, uh, some, some uh, hubs, TTF in the Netherlands, for example, Norwegian gas to Belgium, Algerian gas to Italy, but there's also the, the Russian gas to the, to the Czech Republic pipeline gas. And as you may see, it's fairly aligned with other, other uh, supplies, other, other prices. Because again, it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult for, for supplier to, to offer some specific prices, simply because you as a supplier do know that given country is connected to the hubs across the European Union it may exchange natural gas with, uh, with those, those, those hubs in Western part of Europe. And it's difficult for you to manipulate the, the market, both economically and politically. Um, just to illustrate it very practically, uh, let's take, for example, Poland. Um, again, used to be country fully dependent on Russian supplies and also being exposed politically to this, to this pressure. In the last few years, European Union money was used to build LNG uh, terminal in Svinosia, the same in, for, for, for Lithuania, for example. Um, the, the physical pipeline to the North Sea is being built to get Norwegian gas through country. And which is even more important, the, the whole governance structure and the whole market regulation was introduced to the country as well, somehow supervising and managing the trade with natural gas, which limits the, again, the, the, I need to emphasize it once again, limiting the politicization of the whole trade and the whole, uh, whole uh, 
uh, natural gas sector, which is very prone to, to, to politicization. Um, so this is about like this, this, this competition, these completely different perspectives, how natural gas should be traded from the perspective of Russia, um, natural gas is part of its foreign policy. The, the, the agreements and treaties should be done ad hoc, should be done uh, Russia versus given country on a bilateral basis and based on current situation. From the perspective of the European Union, there is very intense effort to depoliticize supplies and trade with natural gas. Uh, to, 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 to subordinate it to the market rules that are universal for everybody, to connect the whole European Union to one market that is strong enough and resilient enough to any external pressure, save for the complete cutoff. Nobody really planned for current situation. Like the, 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 the whole idea was to shield European countries, like individual countries from foreign pressure, not to shield the European Union as a whole from uh, like being cut off of Russian supplies because of the invasion to Ukraine. Nobody planned this scenario. Few words about Ukraine. Ukraine is obviously not the, uh, the member of uh, the European Union, but, and this is important, it is slowly, very slowly embracing the, uh, this European Union governance and European Union rules and European Union ideas about how, how the whole sector should be, should be organized. And don't, don't get me wrong, it's still a very corrupted country. It's still two steps forward, one step back, but it, it is simply inching very slowly to the European Union. Just a few examples. Uh, 2010 gas market law was introduced, basically mimicking the, to some extent, the European Union standards, unbundling the separation of production of natural gas from, from transportation, third party access principle, allowing uh, new entrants to the, to, the, to the gas pipelines, transparency in terms of, in terms of prices, in terms of amounts, uh, independent regulatory authority was introduced in, in Ukraine. Prices started to be reformed. So uh, landscape changes in the sector. Again, very slow, but in the right direction and continuous. Um, in 2011, Ukraine was adopted to energy community that this is the tool of the European Union like the institution that covers uh, Balkan countries and, and Ukraine. And the idea is that to enter this institution, you need to adopt Aki Comunitarity, the energy law of the European Union, and, and it should speed up somehow your, your access to the European Union. So you're obliged to implement the European Union standards and rules. 2012, 2030, uh, multiple foreign companies were invited to invest into the uh, into Ukraine uh, natural gas deposits to increase the, the, the domestic production. Ukraine is a significant producer of, of natural gas, some 20 BC, uh, 20 BCM per, per year. Um, following the uh, the occupation of Crimea the direct imports of, of natural gas from Russia ceased and Ukraine linked itself to the, uh, to the, to the uh, markets of Poland and Slovakia and Hungary, like physical pipelines delivering those missing 10 BCMs um, to, to Ukraine. Um, transit has been decreasing. The, 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 the pipeline I mentioned in the beginning the transit through this pipeline has been decreasing. It's not that much because Ukraine uh, won't say it. it's, it's, it's mainly because of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, but it, it, it is a fact. Um, I've, I've mentioned corruption and the NAFTA has in this regard was a powerhouse of, of, of oligarchs and political figures in, uh, in Ukraine. That's the main uh, energy company and, and politicians and, and oligarchs 
used to milk it for their own profit. Um, the independent international supervisory board was, was, was introduced, consisting of, of experts from, from Western countries, etc., 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 etc. So, um, slow process, but Ukraine has been moving to the West, even in terms of decarbonization and Paris Agreement targets, and it is breaking its relationship in this very sphere of energy with, with Russia. And I'm um, back to the, what, what Roman mentioned, what is the importance of, of, of energy in the current invasion of Russia to Ukraine? The, 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 the energy is not the primary reason. This is not the primary reason why Russia invaded Ukraine. I do not believe that, but it is a it is a illustration or or indicator that Russia has been losing its grip over the country. Simply that the country is moving to the to the west, and let's be honest, Russia has very limited soft power. It has very limited. It, it, it doesn't have that much to offer to to the neighboring countries. So, and 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 energy subsidized energy or, or cheap supplies of energy is one of the few tools that Russia has to, to offer to the neighboring countries. So if Ukraine has been cutting itself off of Russia's energy, it's a very strong indicator that it is moving to, to the West. So I'm, I'm not saying that energy is the reason why Russia is, is invaded, but definitely it was a proof for Russia that the country is moving in the in the opposite direct direction. Three or four last words about the European Union reaction. I guess that we'll be talking about that in a moment. Um, in a response to war, uh, European Union. Well, obviously, it's a huge problem. As I mentioned, European Union is dependent on on Russian supplies, and it's dependent. This dependency has been increasing because of the decarbonization, um, switching to natural gas uh, instead of using coal or, or, or nuclear. So it's a huge problem and, and European Union is not able, at, at least it seems, to cut itself off of Russian supplies, but it introduced plans to uh, limit, it, limit its exposure, stop importing uh, natural, natural gas, oil, and and coal from this country by 2027 using the the, the usual suspects: energy efficiency, renewables, um, LNG from other countries, hydrogen. Um, these issues, but probably we'll talk about that more um, during during the during the debate. So, bridge is yours, Roman. So thank you very much. This was as informative as it was nuanced. And um, I truly personally enjoyed the, the presentation and hearing your thoughts. So thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure to uh, hear your take in detail. Um, what I would like to do is to offer my remarks that are partially in response to some of the questions that um, were asked prior to uh, presentation and also just offer um, a brief uh, brief thoughts on what's really what does it mean for the Russian energy system what does it mean for the Russian energy sector and what does it mean for the global energy transition so um, well, let me start with I think a pretty a pretty strong statement in, in, a, in, a, in a way that is probably more universally accepted that um, mass media uh, portrays there are no winners in this war we won't be able to look at this war and said well you know russia 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 lost ukraine won. um in the conventional sense this is where i think it's going to end um uh, from the military analysis that i've been parsing together to um uh, simply tracking the progress of of this invasion uh, of this senseless war um, but there will not be winners 
Um, there will be uh, obviously the victims that already fell, especially the civilians in the Ukrainian cities. There will be orphans. There will be um, uh, people with horrific injuries. Um, there will be uh, millions of Ukrainians suffering from PTSD, right? So having said that, um, I think the ultimate loser, the ultimate, ultimate loser in this absolutely unexplicable, unjustified invasion is the country of Russia. Um, I don't see a single scenario, not a single scenario, in which Russia emerges out of this conflict in a much, much worse, worse position than it started this conflict. It can be either much, much worse or catastrophically worse in my, at this point. Um, so um, there was a question about to what extent um, the dependence of Europe on Russian energy uh, motivated uh, Putin's decision to invade. I think um, there are way too many people right now who is trying to play a uh, psychiatrist for um, Vladimir Putin right now. So I will not try to get into his head, but um, I do think that it was a factor uh, because um, there was a shortage and historically high prices, natural gas prices in Europe. Um, the shortage was uh, predominantly due to the rebound of the economy and the curtailment of production uh, due to COVID prior to the invasion. So there was a, um, obviously, um, uh, it played role. So the dependence was high, um, I would say. And the global dependence on Russian oil was also high because of the rebound in the economy after COVID. So was that a determinative factor or main factor? I don't think so, but it was definitely a contributing factor. Um, now, what does it mean for Russia? What does it mean uh, this, this war means for the Russian energy sector? Uh, the short term, um, uh, a great deal of economic pain. Um, we already see the reduction in the Russian exports. So the exports of crude oil in Russia and, and, and um, petroleum products fell by about one third um, as of um, a week ago. Uh, that is due to the fact that um, there is very, very, there's quite limited um, um, amount of financing possible for um, Russian oil and gas because of potential sanctions. Essentially, uh, uh, people are buying Russian oil, but they're buying it A, in decreased quantities, and B, in, uh, with quite a bit of discount. Um, Royal Dutch Shell paid uh, 20, I think, $8 less for a barrel than it would have um, paid for, say, a, a barrel of rent. Um, so that means shrinking revenues right now, not when the, uh, there's less and less and less of export opportunities, but right now. So we see the loss in export revenue all the way right now. Long-term, um, the implications I do believe uh, might be catastrophic. And I do not think that Russia will regain uh, or expand into new markets. Um, oil is a very particular commodity and not oil, all oil is alike. So there is a market for certain type of grades um, um, that are essentially petroleum facilities that can take that type of oil. So the Russian oil euros can only go to a limited number of refineries in the world. It cannot go to any refinery in the world, which means uh, that something needs to happen somewhere. You know, uh, the, the refining capacity needs to change. The refineries will need to be modernized. Um, so it is a long-term impact, a long-term loss of the market, even though, uh, if, even if some actors will get creative with avoiding sanctions. So what does it mean also uh, in terms of the existing capacity? So the existing capacity, the current levels of production will need to be curtailed. And in order to curtail an oil field, it's not as simple as just you know, taking a, um, 
uh, a plug and try to plug in um, a, a well like you would a, a wine bottle, for example. It's not that simple. Um, that does impact the integrity of oil fields. It does uh, cost a lot of money. So essentially, the um, the the oil that was almost too cheap to uh, not produce in Russia, it will become much more expensive to produce. So the cost will go up and the revenues will go down because of the shrunk market and because of the um, uh, because of the um, the additional essential expenses, right? So uh, what else? Um, the foreign equipment and technologies are absent in Russia and mass. Oil business is a difficult business. Oil technology is a very, very high-tech technology, especially if you're, you're managing a, a field, a mature field that needs to be stimulated, that needs to be uh, managed properly. So um, Russia has some capacity, Russian companies have some capacity to do so, but those capacities are limited. Um, with those technologies being gone, uh, we're pretty much back in the USSR, where uh, the primary way to increase production or stimulate production is to flood an oil field. And that's a, not a good idea. Um, so um, environmental damage, um, we can see that. We already see possible um, increase in methane um, emissions because of the management of curtailment of the production capacity because of the float and storage um, where oil is stored and there is an emission, emissions that uh, come from uh, oil evaporating, methane emissions. So um, the situation is not good. Now, finally, the implications for the energy transition. Um, I'm gonna say something that is might sound controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. In a way, the world needed Saudi Arabia and Russia for um, the success of the ongoing energy transition. You might think how and why. Well, because both countries have significant spare capacities. They have a lower carbon oil in comparison to uh, newer fields, deeper fields, um, harder to extract fields. And um, um, uh, three, um, um, so maybe basically that means that um, uh, having this, this spare capacities um, and a low cost oil means that um, you don't necessarily have to go and try to find new one, right? So you don't have to create a project that will, uh, in theory, last decades. So now Russia is out, um, Saudi Arabia is still there, um, but the plant energy transition or more plant energy transition, in my view, has been impacted. So um, what's next is, um, is anyone's guess, but I do think that the short-term solutions that have been put on the table um, such as um, restarting some of the coal generation in, in, in Europe, relying more on coal and uh, maybe not phasing out for Germany a nuclear power as, as quickly as they hope. Um, I hope those solutions do not become, uh, band-aid solutions become uh, permanent solutions. Um, so um, one thing, if anything, this war showed us in the context um, of, the energy, uh, of the energy transition is that sudden interruptions in the world sort of energy order, um, they will have profound impact on the pace and on the, um, and on the really me mechanics of the energy transition. And the existing conceptual approaches to uh, planning, to forecasting, the traditional approaches, conventional approaches to energy security, they're hardly adequate in understanding and planning and um, essentially preparing and improving energy decisions. So uh, hopefully my remarks made sense uh, and I would like to turn to Q and A. Uh, and we have three questions already, but I am going to start with the questions that were submitted prior to uh, the event. And Philippe, could you please um, elaborate um, um, on a little bit on Germany? So, and I'm, um, 
uh, bunch in three questions essentially than the other. And um, the first question really is, what did you think about um, uh, Chancellor Scholz's speech to the German parliament? Um, what um, do you think um, German response will be in substituting its dependence, especially on um, industrial uh, in, in industrial use of uh, industrial use of Russian gas? And um, the third part of the question is, um, what do you think about the uh, participation of the figures like uh, Gerhard Schroeder in the various Russian well, in particular in Gazprom. Right, so first comment to the long-term politics of, or long-term policy of, uh, of Germany, this, this special relationship to Russia. Um, now, obviously Germany is in, in a huge shock, like basically, their long-term policy of being very close to Russia is, is, is destroyed. This whole policy started in, I believe, 70s with Willy Brandt and his Ostpolitik. The idea that Germany needs to be, there needs to be communication with back then Soviet uh, Union, now, now Russia, and, and, and Europe needs to communicate with uh, with Russia and and the Germany needs to spearhead this communication because uh, it is so guilty in terms of like destroying during the Second World War, destroying the whole country and 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 killing so many people. So so uh, Germany has this special obligation to communicate with Russia and to drag it back uh, to to Europe using trade, using communication no security problems could be solved without discussing them with with russia confrontation is not an option so this that that was the long-term strategy of of germany combined with their pacifistic approach like not using not using guns uh, not not selling guns to sensitive areas etc so very strong connection between between uh, uh, germany and between uh, between Russia. And that was there for a very long time. It's deeply embedded in, in the thinking of social democrats, Christian democrats. It's, 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 it's omnipresent in, in Germany, or it was omnipresent in German society. So this situation like destroyed everything. And it explained why it was so difficult for, for Germany to take some strong stance in the beginning of the situation. Because for them, it's really like, um, if, if in the United States Republicans would start to call for a, like a strong gun restriction or whatever, like complete change of, of, of their thinking. So it was very difficult for, for Germany to, 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 to accept the fact that this 50 years long policy of incorporating Russia into Europe failed. And it relates to the, the second question you asked, the, 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 the energy, because really the long-term strategy of Germany was to, was to decarbonize, obviously. And they've built the whole project of energy vendor, the energy ship. They build it on the idea that uh, Europe has no fossil fuels. And at the same time, there's this problem with climate change. So we need to switch to 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 low carbon sources renewables and we do that in a way that we get rid of nuclear power plants very quickly um that's a, that's another pro like mental problem of, of of germans that they really like to get rid of this technology uh, of coal so future really relies in in um in renewables and in between these renewables the 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 gaps in the in the provision of heat and electricity would be filled with natural gas. So really they, they reoriented their whole energy and industrial sector to the to Russian natural gas, like to a huge extent, believing that because of this like strong connection and believing that, that Russia is maybe a rough neighbor, but still reasonable and still like 
in the in the in the sphere of European communication. So they would be able to use the the Russian source, hence building the Nord Stream one and two to to. That's that's the way how to do their transformation. Now they have all these plans, but without gas, it's almost impossible to do that. Like there's if if you if you if you uh, shut down or decommission the nuclear power plants and coal fired power plants, and you are struggling with building uh, renewables in Germany, they 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 done like the low hanging fruit. But if you look at the at the new installations, they are very small in Germany. So they are in, in some transition phase and they do really need the natural gas. And they're trying to find a way how to, how to obviously get by without Russian gas now. So there are debates about building two uh, LNG terminals uh, because they do have none. Uh, so to, to have uh, two LNG terminals to import uh, LNG from either uh, United States or Qatar or Australia, whatever. But if you look at the data and if you look at the the debate in in uh, in Germany, they almost have no other option than importing Russian gas, unless they are willing to sacrifice a huge deal of their industry and their out, uh, economic output. Now, if you look at the at the German news. They are really like the, the political pressure is there and public pressure is there. So they start slowly to debating, like really stopping importing fossil fuels from from uh, from Russia. But the Ministry of uh, of Environment said that clearly, and you would expect him to be more in favor of, of limiting hydrocarbons, and he really is. But he said, okay, but we need to acknowledge that stopping. Uh, natural gas from Russia would mean for many years, three, maybe four years, huge economic downturn, unemployment in hundreds of thousands of people, and plenty of companies shut down. So for them, especially for Germany, because it's, it imports more than half of their consumption of natural gas from Russia, that should be said. And 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 uh, another thing is that natural gas is not used only for heating and and um, electricity to back up renewables, but it is used also for industrial processes uh, in industry and chemical processes, plastics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not only about heat and, and electricity. And about Schroeder, well, it's a sad story, obviously, um, but he's not the only one. He's only the the most prominent figure, but. If you look at Russian companies, you would find plenty of plenty of uh, high-ranked politicians from Austria. It's typical for Austrian. Are you there? Ah, okay. Um, uh, it's typical for politicians from Austria. Uh, uh, plenty of people from from uh, Italy. Even I believe former Prime Minister of Finland was employed by Russian energy companies. So and. We do have even this term shredderization, like describing this whole phenomenon. Um, what could I say? Well, obviously it's a shame. Uh, and yeah, what, what else to say about that? Like, like it's, it's, it's a shame. It's not against the law, but there is no sunset clause in this, in this, in this regard, like preventing politicians uh, from jumping right from politics to to uh, to energy business, especially in Russia, it's not against the law, but obviously it's a shame and 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 uh, it should not be tolerated. Um, yeah, sorry. All right. So thank you. You know, as one energy nerd to another energy nerd, we can probably talk about this for a long, long time. So I'm now sorry, I'm sorry. going to do. I'm going to do. I'm going to do something that is for me is um, probably the most difficult. Um, exercise. We're going to do a lightning round. We're going to be answering several questions under 30 seconds. All oh. right, 30 seconds or less. All right. So get ready for this. And I will give you, I'll give you a break for one. I'll just, um, because it's more of a comment. All right. So, okay. Now, um, where can people find more information about the EU, EU's plan to phase out natural gas? You, we don't have the time to talk about, you know, the details, but where, what, which, which uh, space to watch? We cannot hear you. I'm sorry. 
we cannot hear you at all. Maybe I just cannot hear it. Can everyone hear? Um, Philippe? Is better now? Yeah, right now. Yeah. We okay. Can. So yeah. obviously the pages of European Commission for, for basic introduction to the topic and for the data. If you'd like to have more uh, like elaborate opinions and, and uh, even some critique, definitely euroactive.com. They do follow European Union politics, but it's like the independent, uh, independent news. And if you're really into energy uh, stuff, not only the energy European Union as a whole, but energy issues, energypost.eu, I believe it is, energy yeah. post. And, and those are like the two, three main sources I would start with. Fantastic. So next next question from Roy Teba. I, I, I apologize if I butcher your last name and to all people that I, <laughs> whose names I butchered. Is there a special significance to Russia immediately capturing Ukraine nuclear plants regarding the mutual energy supplies for the EU? Um, my, my take is probably not unless they're interconnected with the EU grid. I don't think they are, right? In terms of electricity? Mm -hmm. um, no, not, not really. Not, now the European Union is, is, is connected to Ukraine and is trying to stabilize the grid there. So it is, okay, European yeah. Union is, is, is helping Ukraine in this, in this regard. Because obviously the infrastructure is being being destroyed, there. but in the long term, it's it's the 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 import export is is very small from or to Ukraine because different frequencies, this kind of stuff. So okay. now it's useful in, in during the war. So yes, actually yes, because then it will impact, right? Because if you know, yeah. essentially they have to stabilize the system. Okay, so um, now um, for you know a comment, and I'm giving you relief that we actually. Um, Ukraine is very advanced in energy um, efficiency, absolutely, and not just energy efficiency. In my view, uh, Ukraine, and it's just working uh, with Ukrainian energy scholars, my actual most recent piece actually was on Ukraine. Um, I find uh, the Ukrainian approach to energy policy far more um, uh, holistic and sophisticated than that of Russia. You know, for Russia, it's essential hydrocarbons and, and, and subsidized nuclear. Right, so um, now uh, very close to home, very quickly. Um, implications for the Czech Republic? Um, the, it applies to the Czech Republic and what, as one of those more conservative countries in terms of like thinking about climate change, but I believe it applies to like the whole Eastern part of Europe. Very important point is that this invasion somehow weakened the position of very conservative people like those not believing in the climate change, sticking to internal combustion engine, happy with coal. And suddenly uh, th those people are aligning with the, with the more green people in Eastern Europe. And like fantastic comment from one of the most conservative politicians in, in the Czech Republic illustrates this, this change of thinking. And he, he mentioned that basically every household in the Czech Republic should be equipped with rooftop uh, javelin missiles but it's it's funny but it illustrates that it somehow it is getting more conservative people and people that are skeptical about renewables energy efficiency phasing out of coal it gets them more to these long-term decarbonization processes and i believe it's a it's it's not that much discussed but it will be more important in the in the future that that decarbonization will be more framed also as a um, strategic goal, not only the, the climate goal. And I believe it's a it's 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 very interesting development. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, end us there. I want to thank you both for um, again what could have been a, a much longer discussion. Thank you so much to our audience for many great questions, um, and really um, uh, appreciate your uh, ideas for where to keep an eye out for further developments um, as we um, experience right a, a a real tumult right in Central and Eastern Europe um, in the energy space. So many thanks to both Professors Chernok and Professor Sodortsov. Um, before we let you all go. We do have a couple of things to keep an eye on. Um, uh, two new energy series uh, talks coming up on March 30th and April 13th. So one looking at climate change and, and, and artificial intelligence. And the other um, on the 13th looking at um, off-grid technologies in sub-Saharan Af Africa. So uh, stay tuned for, um, for those if you're interested in um, what's new in energy scholarship. 
And then right in the middle, Tuesday, April 5, we're kicking off our spring series on critical materials in the energy space with Edith Wilson, a Dartmouth, um, a Dartmouth alum, and the CEO of Rock Whisperer on how critical materials are, are involved in powering the new energy economy. So thank you again all for joining us today and um, be well.